Uh, our next presenter will be Christina Collins. Um, her call sign is KD8 uh, o, OXT. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for that, Mike. Uh, John's going to be so excited to, uh, to see that. All right, so now we get to turn to a, uh, a fun part of the personal space weather station, the, the grape side of things in particular, which is getting to play with the beacons. And this uh, is a project that happened in no small part at, uh, at Mike's suggestion, the, um, the test signal. Uh, that is currently running on WWV and WWVH to explore ways that they could be uh, modified for additional scientific purpose. Um, brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. I will show you the test signal in case you've not heard it before. I'll talk a little bit about the work of the working group, which I have uh, been managing, and the, uh, the overview of the different parts of the signal and the design principles we've been following. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the upcoming campaign to, uh, to try measuring the signal in a coordinated way and some of the design ideas going into that and its context in the other pilot campaigns that we've done for the uh, low-cost PSWS. All right, a word here on uh, where this fits in the conference. Of course, we've just heard uh, Mike's talk and See, Bill Lyles will be coming up to, uh, to talk a little bit more about analysis of the signal after I introduce it here. And um, Kung Nguyen has a uh, poster tomorrow on the uh, um, algorithm for looking at the signal in a, uh, a systematic way, which I'm working on currently setting up to be used in the, uh, the contest that I'll be talking about here. And then Folks who were uh, at, in attendance in the virtual conference last year will remember the co-design panel um, that we had that Saturday. There's going to be some things from that showing up here as well when we get to the elements of campaign design. All right, so here's the, uh, the signal, and we'll see if playing this video works. The video is by uh, KOKA, who has the YouTube channel Signal Phantom. Highly recommend if you like listening to number stations and things like that, and he did this beautiful visualization. At the tone, 22 hours, 8 minutes, coordinated universal time. Follows is a scientific modulation test. For more information, visit hamsci.org slash WWV. So that's the, uh, the pseudo-random noise, and then we have the coherent tones. My favorite part, the chirps. Same pseudo-random noise again. All right. He actually recorded that seven times, so I'm going to stop it there. Um, so yes, this is the, uh, the breakdown of the signal. The DOI number there takes you to a page that includes the MATLAB code that was used to synthesize it and various versions of the signal, so you can get in CSV format, you can get in WAV format. Um, and there's also some, uh, some test recordings that have been made um, if you'd like to, to try analysis out. So. Uh, the Scientific Modulation Working Group includes many of the folks that were uh, acknowledged in the previous presentations, members of um, NIST leadership, the staff of both stations, um, folks from the, uh, the GRAPE team, and uh, the WW0WV, which is the amateur radio club of uh, WWV, and they handle a lot of the, um, the outreach, and they're currently um, handling the repository for GRAPE data. Um, so the membership of the working group is about 20 people. And the objective is to uh, develop recommendations generally for what might be done to improve uh, the utility of WWV and WWVH's scientific beacons um, in a way that is uh, 
consonant with its mission as uh, the station's mission as part of NIST and NIST as part of the Department of Commerce. Um, the current status, again, is that the signal that you heard before is running on both stations since 15th of November. These were the, uh, the design principles, um, which were laid out generally by Phil Erickson, W1PJE, and I really like this list, and we go over it at each of our working group meetings, which we hold about once a month or so. Um, the first one is primum non nocere, first do no harm. Uh, this is an existing piece of infrastructure, and we want to make sure that we don't break anything that anyone has already built on top of it. Um, and we want to do something that is, to the greatest extent possible, useful to the general community of users and not just us. And then the other question we're working on is uh, what can we tie back to, uh, to scientific purpose? So when we first um, started talking about the idea of putting this together, it began uh, in part with a talk that Phil and Steve Serwin gave um, to the Time and Frequency Division at NIST. And the question was posed to them, what would you like to see added to the stations? And one idea that had been sort of tossed around was it would be nice if there was a chirp so that we could do time of flight measurement. But um, this is, you know, an observation variable that sort of exists, you know, is kind of a, a thing that tied into things that we were looking at. And it is, in fact, part of sort of a, a larger space where we have a science question at the beginning and then that evolves into an engineering recommendation. And I want to emphasize that this is a, uh, you know, really kind of a high dimension space. There's lots of things that we could explore. There are different tools that we can use to explore them. So what we have in the current test signal is a subset of this, um, which we arrived at in various ways. And, uh, Bill will be talking in, in more depth about the, um, the different parts of the signal and the analysis that has been undertaken so far. Uh, the ones that I've been particularly focusing on are here. Everything else is kind of space in between and voice announcements and things like that. Um, and these are enumerated here. I'm going to sort of skip past this in the interest of time. Um, but these are also covered in the, uh, the signal page that is linked with the DOI on an earlier slide. All right, so then the next question that I wanted to talk about is how do we take this and um, extrapolate it into a test campaign? Um, some of you may know the, uh, the, sunrise, or the eclipse festivals and the festival of frequency measurement, different projects that um, we have done as pilot experiments for the grape. Um, having people collect data using their own radio stations. And so this is a fairly established paradigm to do these, uh, these pilot campaigns. Um, and they have gotten a lot of people to start operating grapes or to start collecting data or sort of using uh, the same recording practices to just get a better sense of their own geospace environment by recording a day of data and finding the sunrise peak, things like that. Um, so. One of the things that I wanted to do is set up a weekend campaign where we look specifically at the sunrise peak and we have people make time of flight measurements and look for a uh, multipath because that is an interesting thing that happens at the start of the day. And the feedback that I've been getting from the pilot campaigns is that participants are interested in more analysis and you don't want to have the feeling that you're putting your data in and it's sort of just going into a box and who knows what will happen to it or if it will be looked at. Um, so one thing that has come up is this idea of maybe we should do something that's a little more radio sports style. Let's see here. Next slide. Yay. Okay. So if you uh, saw the conference last year, this has some, uh, some echoes to this concept of going from a contributory or crowdsource model of um, data collection to a, uh, a truly co-designed model where volunteers are part of the entire process of experiment design and hypothesizing and so on. And um, that this would be something where we would establish some design principles for sort of ham campaigns um, and make it a, uh, a flywheel for this workshop and uh, to include citizens in the um, the entire practice uh, of 
putting the campaign together. So we talked about that last year. We had a very good discussion. And I'm hoping to use the, uh, the Sunrise Festival as an excuse to do some of those things. I will note it is the same weekend that there is an eclipse, but the path of totality for that eclipse is not particularly conducive. So I just used it as a, a reason to schedule. This is a nice thing about scheduling things around eclipses. You have two a year. So one of the tools I'm going to be bringing in for this, many people here will probably be familiar with Jupyter Notebook. Um, if you are, great. If you are not, the best way that I can describe it is that it's one of those uh, software solutions that's a bit like chicken pot pie. You should not combine dinner and dessert in such a way, but you do and it kind of works. Um, and it's a, uh, a way that you can have an interactive computing environment that you run in a browser. You can incorporate multiple programming languages into it. It's very good for this type of thing where you have a process that you want people to run and be able to customize just slightly. And so this is hopefully a way to uh, encourage people to try playing with a little bit of Python code in a way that's going to be approachable and browser-based. So um, I'll be taking Kuhn's work, and I've been putting that into a, uh, a binder, which is a way to run a Jupyter Notebook solely in a browser. And uh, we'll see how it goes. That's on GitHub, still a work in progress. Hopefully, we'll have all of this happily launched well before the end of April. And so I encourage you to mark your calendars for the, uh, the Sunrise Festival. It's our Maypole theme going on there. Um, and we'll be uh, observing time of flight and uh, multipath over the five hours or so that it takes the sun to rise over North America. So thanks very much, and uh, I'll take questions.